Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 MLK Day Lecture. Um, I'm Professor Darren Hutchinson. I teach social justice and constitutional law related courses here at Emory. And tonight is my pleasure to introduce you to Janae Nelson. Janae Nelson is the president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, known as LDF. LDF was founded in 1940 by civil rights lawyer and the first black Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, uh, which separated from the NAACP in 1957. And by my count, LDF is the first and only civil rights organization founded by a future Supreme Court Justice. Um, LDF attorneys were instrumental in a lot of um, broad social justice projects, the most famous being the litigation strategy that gave us Brown versus Board of Education and a lot of the subsequent desegregation cases. Um, before assuming her current role, um, Director Nelson served as LDF Associate Director Counsel and as a member of LDF's litigation and policy teams. She's also served as Interim Director of LDF's Thurgood Marshall Institute and in various other leadership capacities at LDF. Following the trend that was started was Sherilyn Eiffel, who was also a law professor. Janae Nelson um, had an um, illustrious career in academia before joining LDF. She was a full professor at St. John's University, where she also had a position as Associate Dean for Faculty Scholarship and Development, and also the Associate Director of the Ronald Brown Center for Civil Rights and Economic Development. Her research, as well as um, her litigation today, focused on voting rights, election law, and she continues to lend her voice to this subject as um, in, in academic writings, um, as demonstrated by two recent publications, one in the Columbia Law Review and one in the um, NYU Law Review. She also was a recipient of the 2013 Derrick Bell Award from the Association of American Law Schools, um, section on minority groups. And by way of education, Director Nelson received her bachelor's from New York University and JD from UCLA, where she was busy at that time as well, serving as the articles editor for the UCLA Law Review, consulting editor, editor of the National Black Law Journal and associate editor of the UCLA Women's Law Journal. So she likes to keep busy. She's been doing this for quite a while. And after law school, had um, a couple of very illustrious um, clerkships at the Federal District Court and Court of Appeals. It's an honor and a privilege to present Emory University School of Law's 2023 MLK Day speaker, Janae Nelson. Thank you, thank you, Darren. I appreciate that very much. Um, and that was a very generous and, and thorough introduction. So I appreciate that. Please allow me to congratulate you on your chair and your directorship. You're the chair, the John Lewis Chair of Civil Rights and Social Justice here at Emory Law and also the director of that center. And I believe you also wear the hat of the diversity and inclusion officer here at the law school. What an honor and what a hefty responsibility. I know you are doing wonderful things in that position or those positions, I should say. So thank you for having me. I very much appreciate it. It's wonderful to see you all. Uh, I am thrilled to be here and thrilled to recognize so many familiar faces in the audience. It's, it's really lovely to be back here at Emory School of Law. And it is the perfect place to have a conversation about the moral imperatives and the moral inspiration of Dr. King's life in this particular moment. I also can't imagine a better place to have this conversation than at Emory Law where John Lewis had the exhortation of the 2014 class, I believe it was, to engage in trouble, necessary trouble, good trouble, and only become more intense since he said those words. So we are in the right place for this conversation. I 
also think this time is appropriate for us. We are about two weeks from the, or just a few weeks from the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And we are in the same year of the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And in a week where we are remembering one of the greatest humanitarian leaders in our history, it is fitting that we have this conversation. He would have been Dr. King, 94 years old this week. And the convergence of these milestones underscores the crossroads at which we sit as a country. We are on the verge of radical societal transformation as we were some two centuries ago when we signed the Emancipation Proclamation and just over half a century ago. And we find ourselves at this moment set against a backdrop of threatened violence and internecine conflict on the one hand, and the promise of a people powered revolution of ideals on the other. And indeed it was that backdrop to the historic march on Washington for jobs and freedom that propelled this country forward. Most people remember that march for Dr. King's I have a dream speech. Some remember that march for the stunning feat of organizing roughly a quarter of a million people from different races and different backgrounds from all over the country to peaceably assemble and demand radical transformational change. However, we, as we all know, the March on Washington was much more than that. It was more than one historic speech. It was more than a record-breaking crowd. The March on Washington, both the event itself and its ramifications was so much bigger. It was proof that when we combine our capacity for human decency with our powers of reason, when we use the tools of government to construct new moral foundations, we can accelerate the pace of societal transformation and secure a better and more just future. In other words, we must understand the I have a dream speech and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and even the Civil Rights Acts of 1968 that included the Fair Housing Act and was passed right after the assassination of Dr. King. We need to see all of those events as part of a whole, as nation altering, democracy building change, buttressed by the decision you mentioned, Brown versus Board of Education, which the Legal Defense Fund and families from five states courageously won. But it was also an outgrowth of organized peaceful protests across the country, civil disobedience across the country, especially here in the South, that together the statutes, the protests, the movement formed a radical rebellion against injustice. So to view the sweeping legal change and protest and organizing of the civil rights movement as anything less than symbiotic stratagems is to erect a false division between the poetry of Dr. King's moral vision and the prose of these imperative pieces of legislation. The reality is that enduring transformational change cannot happen unless we combine the power and permanence of the law with evolving principles of freedom and equality led by the people. For our growth, we need both. As Dr. King once said, it may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can restrain him from lynching me. So while the law may not change the hearts of men, it does change the habits of men if it is vigorously enforced. And through changes in habits, pretty soon attitudinal changes will take place and even the heart may be changed in the process. So we be, who believe in justice, in, in racial justice in particular, must always keep this synergy in mind, especially in this moment, which many, including our president, has called the fight for the soul of this nation. Despite the important role that 
some of our democratic institutions and electoral processes have played over the past two years in protecting us from some of the very worst outcomes. The stubborn fact is that US democracy is in existential peril. We are living in precarious times. Principles we once thought fundamental are being challenged. Norms we once thought fixed have been abandoned and mores we once took for granted are being discarded. Central to this tumult is the notion of white supremacy. White supremacy, which while never erased, had been submerged as a popular ideology. But as we sit here today, within some of our democratic institutions and in cities and towns across this country, white nationalist ideology has been revitalized and openly popularized among a vociferous minority faction. It carries forward a toxic mix of anti-Black racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, LGBTQIA hate and violence, anti-Asian violence, indigenous erasure, and misogyny, among other hateful pathologies and demagoguery. So at this moment in our history, when so much is unraveling and when so much is at stake, what lessons can we draw from Dr. King and the tectonic movement that he helped lead and that forever shaped the direction of this country? I posit that there are two critical lessons in this moment. The first is to recognize that just as there are times when we need law to prevent us from our worst human impulses, so too are there moments when we need those human impulses to show us where the law has fallen short. Second, and relatedly, the unfinished business of race will continue to threaten our downfall if we don't accept that that business is our ongoing duty in order to make the promise of our multiracial, multiethnic democracy real. Race and racism will be our crippling Achilles heel if we do not continually and actively confront it and accept that it is a chronic condition of the heart of these United States. And it requires ongoing treatment to prevent it from metastasizing. So allow me to expound on that first point and say something that perhaps we all know intuitively, but in this setting seems a bit sacrilegious to say, and that is that laws alone, and certainly if left alone, will not save us. The rule of law is absolutely necessary, but it is not sufficient. Good laws, even great laws, to say nothing of the processes through which they are enforced, can be or can become inadequate. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 68, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, for example, all enacted fundamental changes that brought the United States closer to fulfilling its foundational promises, promises of freedom, promises of equality. At the same time, however, all of these landmark history-making acts also fell short of their initial and fundamental promises in delivering full justice and equality to their intended beneficiaries. At present, the Voting Rights Act is a shadow of its former self. It took several essential amendments and extensions of the VRA to do its most muscular work towards creating a true multiracial democracy. In 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was initially passed, there were only five Black elected officials in Congress and only 1,400 Black elected officials nationwide. By the end of the 1970s, the total number of Black elected officials had more than tripled to nearly 5,000. Now there are well over 10,000 Black elected officials in this country. And I credit today's increasingly diverse elected leaders in significant part to the Voting Rights Act. In the 118th Congress alone, which is the most diverse in that institution's history by almost any measure, the black number of black elected officials held at 60, and we have Georgia to thank for that, uh, including 
electing the first Jewish senator from this state, despite the fact that you faced voter suppression in the bills that governed your elections. And I should note that LDF challenged SB 202 and unfortunately did not win all of the aspects of our lawsuit. Welcome, Ms. Aaron. The 118th Congress boasts five, 55 Latino members, 18 Asian American and Pacific Islander lawmakers, and 149 women, as well as the first Gen Z member and the first Black Party leader. These gains are notwithstanding the fact that fewer than 30 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, the Supreme Court began to significantly limit its reach. We're coming up on the 10 year anniversary of the Shelby County versus Holder decision, the decision that dealt a death blow to section five of the Voting Rights Act, an essential provision. And just last term, the Supreme Court further hobbled the Voting Rights Act in the Brnovich decision and made section two, the remaining most muscular provision, much narrower and more difficult to enforce. And the Legal Defense Fund this term has a case pending before the Supreme Court that we argued this past fall, Milligan, Milligan versus Merrill, that will further test the Supreme Court's resolve to respect this defining piece of legislation for our democracy. And while we were able to enact important safeguards to better protect our presidential election from election sabotage, uh, passing the Electoral Count Reform Act in December, none of this is any substitute for the comprehensive federal legislation that we need to create national standards and protections for voting to ensure that our multiracial, multiethnic democracy is truly representative. The laws we currently have, to put it bluntly, are simply inadequate to protect the right to vote. Inadequate to protect the right to vote against the wave of voter suppression laws like those here in Georgia that ban refreshments to voters waiting in long lines or place restrictions on secure drop boxes or ban mobile voting. We saw over 400 voter suppression bills introduced in state legislatures in 49 states in 2021 leading up to the midterms. And we expect a similar attack on the right to vote as we lead up to the 2024 elections. We're also approaching the 55th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report next month. That was a report, as many of you know, uh, was commissioned by President Johnson. It was a comprehensive federal study of the state of race relations and inequality in this country. It was a report that declared that our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. And we know that while we've made significant progress on some fronts, stark racial disparities in economic opportunity and security persist. The racial wealth gap is worsening on many fronts. The average black or Latino family has significantly less wealth than the average white family. And that's because of discriminatory policies and practices in labor markets and housing markets and financial services markets. It also is a result of intergenerational government sanctioned policies that thwarted equal access to education and wealth accumulation. Let me give you an example. The average white family today has about 140, 80, sorry, 184,000 in total wealth. And the average black family has only 23,000 in total wealth. The average Latino family has approximately 38,000. Black and Latino families and students in particular carry higher levels of debt, higher levels of student debt, further burdening their prospects, even when they have the benefit of higher education. Black home ownership remains lower than it was a decade ago. It's nearly 30 percentage points lower than white home ownership. And as you might imagine, the pandemic has aggravated each of these factors and all of these economic conditions, Black and Latino communities suffered substantially higher contraction rates 
and death rates from COVID-19 and what was a crisis before the pandemic is now catastrophic. To be clear, transformative legislation that came out of the civil rights movement was extraordinary for its time. It was an unalloyed victory to achieve these remedial statutes and to have the federal government recognize the existence of historical injustices, as well as its obligation to offer prophylactic solutions to ongoing racism. And although these, these laws had a tangible, palpable impact, at present they are inadequate by themselves to address the inequities that persist today and those that face the next generation. We still have so much unfinished business. So why did these acts of Congress, despite their, their seismic impacts, nevertheless fall short? Why is it today, more than half a century after the March on Washington, that so many of the issues Dr. King spent his life struggling to resolve once again threatened to undermine and, and potentially destroy the United States' foundational promise to recognize the rights, the freedoms, the equality inherent in all human beings? Of course, there are many reasons. But I would argue that it is the failure to nourish the interpretation of those laws, to maximize their impact, to fulfill their full promise, to evolve to meet the needs of a more complex society is why they fell short. The failure to continually monitor whether their implementation in the real world accords with our present day understanding of what it would mean to fulfill their basic promise. So Dr. King said, while the law may not change the hearts of men, it does change the habits of men if it is vigorously enforced. If it is vigorously enforced. So organizations like the Legal Defense Fund and our many ally organizations have aggressively and ambitiously utilized these statutes. Our courts, however, have not vigorously enforced them to eradicate the enduring effects of racial discrimination. Our Congress has not imaginatively expanded them to meet this moment. And we, the people, have not sustained a movement that demands comprehensive legal intervention that would deliver the next period of radical change. And what undergirds the failure to maximize the impact of our important laws is directly tied to that second point, to the failure to accept the unending challenge to confront the role of race and racism in American society. So that brings me to my second lesson from Dr. King. Instead of recognizing the codification of these laws as the beginning of a process, our courts, our lawmakers, and many in our society saw it as the culmination of their confrontation with race. We lapsed into complacency and stagnation. Those statutes became the ceiling and not the floor on which we were to build even more. But the good thing is that as bleak as things may feel, this is time to pick up that mantle. This is time to heed Dr. King's warning that tomorrow is today and embrace what he famously referred to as the urgency of now. When you're living through a period of accelerated change, be it in the 1960s or what we are experiencing now in 2023, the worst thing we could do is take our foot off the gas pedal or our hand off the steering wheel. We have the power to direct this unsettling change to propel us forward. And if we've learned anything, it is not to constrain our ambitions or compromise our principles out of fear for doing too much. It's only when we keep pushing boundaries that we can enact not just change, but durable change. It's when we're in overdrive that we can create sustained momentum for ongoing progress. This is especially important when we are facing an onslaught of retrogressive laws, like the voter suppression statutes I've mentioned, or Florida's Anti-Truth Stop Woke Act that I hope many of you are familiar with. The Stop Woke Act, which is 
a statute that Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, uh, pushed into enactment, aims to censor classroom content in colleges and universities by severely restricting educators and students' ability to discuss and learn and talk about issues of race and gender. And there are many copycat laws proliferating and that if they take root, will force the indoctrination of the next generation of students in this country through the omission of fact, the omission of truth, the omission of critical analysis. And in the face of these retrogressive and, and aggressive offenses, we have no choice but to be even bolder, more daring, and more expansive in our interpretation of equity, freedom, and justice. And as part of that work, again, we must confront race and racism head on. Indeed, so much of the inequity plaguing our country today is bound up specifically in the anti-Black racism that is its cellular composition, part of its DNA. The zero-sum scarcity mentality that drives so much of our social and fiscal policy is largely rooted in the historical subjugation of Black people in this country. It is at the root of our policing system, our housing policy, the proliferation of prisons, limitations on healthcare, disjointed and discriminatory voting systems, and even the current assault on reproductive freedom. To quote Thurgood Marshall, who, as you mentioned, founded our organization and went on to become the first Black Supreme Court justice, racism separates but it never liberates. Hatred generates fear, and fear, once given a foothold, binds, consumes, and imprisons. Nothing is gained from prejudice. No one be benefits from racism. Our destinies in this country, regardless of race, ethnicity, color, gender, religion, are bound, which means repairing the recurring harms of this country's racist past and its present is the duty of everyone who wants the privileges and advantages and freedoms of this young democratic experiment. Now, don't take me as someone who thinks that any of this is easy. Transforming our laws and embracing an ongoing reckoning with race and racism is not easy. And having litigated for well over a decade and now having the privilege of leading the Legal Defense Fund, I am acutely aware of the many constraints that any movement for radical change of the status quo must contend with. Nonetheless, I firmly believe that in the face of challenges, we too often underestimate the influence that people can wield when they trust in the power of authentically expressing their lived experiences and daring to demand full recognition of their dignity. As Dr. King's life shows, there are even times when this kind of collective and sustained people power is strong enough to bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice. And so it may seem odd to hear the head of an organization known for Brown versus Board and so many other seminal cases say that the law is not enough. But it's never been enough, and we've always known that. We've always worked in addition to passing civil rights statutes, in addition to litigating cases, we've also fiercely believed in the power of people to no less a degree. The power of people to force a substantively radical confrontation with unjust and unconstitutional conditions in order to transform them. Our origin story is an example of that. LDF was founded in 1940. And the idea of dismantling 100 years of state-sanctioned racial segregation and reversing the effects of 400 years of enslavement seemed radical and quixotic in the extreme. Yet it wasn't even 15 years later that the Supreme Court issued its unanimous decision in Brown because of the courage, the sacrifice, the fearlessness of everyday people. And I believe we find ourselves in similar circumstances today with a similar opportunity to revise our understanding of what's possible in society. To meet the moment, we need to do more than simply pass legislation. 
and establish new legal standards. We need to learn from Dr. King's example by working to infuse the law with an expansive aspiration for justice and committing to continual engagement to endure, to ensure it delivers on its promise. We will need to fight for a shared definition of justice that is flexible and inclusive enough to address not just today's injustices, but the injustices that will confront future generations. Accepting that the problem of race and racism is with us and defines us, but does not have to direct us or drive us is the type of humility and sober self-assessment that this country has been unwilling to embrace to its detriment and perhaps to its demise. But we get to decide whether we will rally in the cause of justice to instigate a refounding of our democracy or whether we will sit back and watch it get captured by a fractious group of dissidents. We get to decide whether we will agitate, protest, organize, and vote in representatives who will legislate vis visionary principles that reflect an evolved concept of freedom. So before I close and take your questions, I'd like to exhort all of you, not just the students here, to do a few things that I believe will help advance this charge that I've laid out. The first is to ring the alarm that we must elevate democracy above all and preach that gospel to others. Given the rife divisions and discord in this country, it is essential that we reinvest in our democratic processes and avoid minoritarian capture. This means that all voices must have a say and have a vote, and that our first order of business is to elect representatives at the state, local, and federal levels who will expand protections for the right to vote and for the protection of our elections. With these in place, we can then fairly and soundly and democratically debate the various social issues about which we may disagree, rather than have them decided by fiat. Second, let's normalize conversations about race, racism, and other pathologies as a collective problem-solving exercise, a national problem-solving exercise. It is part of our history and who we are today. It is the story of America filled with triumph and turmoil, and we must be able to tell it truthfully. We must be able to counter the attack on truth by telling our own stories, whatever they may be, by making ourselves visible, by sharing our lived American experience. The silencing and chilling that results from laws like the Stop Woke Act or, or canceling diversity, equity, inclusion trainings or banning books sends a message that some of our stories are not valued, that our experiences are not the American experience, but it is, and we must claim it. Third, we all have to engage in the work of democracy. Vote, volunteer as a poll worker, organize around issues, and serve in office. Just yesterday, I, uh, I had the honor of attending the inauguration of the first Black governor of the state of Maryland, and only the third Black governor in the entire history of this country, Wes Moore. I'm still feeling chills from that moment. It was incredible. He was joined by the first South Asian Lieutenant Governor of the state of Maryland, Aruna Miller. She emigrated from India when she was just seven years old. She got sworn in on the Bhagavad Gita. He got sworn in on the Bible of Frederick Douglass and his late grandfather. And their landslide election and the ceremony that celebrated their respective stories are proof of the promise that a pluralistic America holds. But you don't have to be a governor. You don't even have to be a mayor like the young Jalen Smith, who's the mayor of Earl, Arkansas, one of the youngest black mayors in history at 18 years old. You can be a school board member. You can be a county clerk or a commissioner 
or a sheriff or a local judge, a tax commissioner, even a coroner who helps to decide what information we get when there is a police killing. At the end of the day, you can position your power by taking a position of leadership in our democracy. Finally, and this one is especially for the students, dare to dream. We are not the end of this story. You have many chapters to write. The foundation that we lay now will determine your future when you are my age. It will determine the future of next generations. And when the moment of truth arises for future generations, we will be asking ourselves, how much more evolved will it be in our thinking about humanity, equality, equity, dignity, inclusion, freedom, and liberation because of the choices that we make today? And answering those questions is our collective work. And we are fortunate to have Dr. King's moral imperatives and inspirations to help guide us. So in this moment, we need audacious imagination. We need aggressive and sustained attention to race and racism. And we need an internalized acceptance that our diversity is our strength, but it also requires hard, hard work. So as King said, tomorrow is today. The future is now. And the challenge is ours. Thank you. How you doing? I'm uh, Jerome Miller. I'm a 2L here at Emory. Uh, one of the uh, kind of issues that I've noticed is that it is very difficult to get uh, different organizations who may have similarly aligned interests uh, to work together uh, with a specific goal in mind. Uh, do you know of any partnerships that exist now to address either racial issues or inequality issues? Or do you have uh, any idea of a type of strategy that could be developed to, to affect that end? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, people don't know on the other side of this, the uh, cohesion that many civil rights organizations and, and social justice organizations share uh, in this struggle. So when there are instances of anti-Asian violence, for example, when there are assaults on LGBTQIA people, when um, the issue of reproductive freedom became a flashpoint in the Supreme Court. Organizations like the Legal Defense Fund, we reach out to our peer institutions, we talk about how we can support one another and what, what resources and strategies we can deploy that will complement and supplement the work that they do. What we try to do, and what I think is critically important given the limited resources that we have, is to make sure that we are spreading out. There are more problems to be solved than there are resources to solve them. And so a coordinated strategy is very important. It doesn't always happen, doesn't always work. Sometimes we are you know, stepping on each other's toes. But as much as possible, we try to support each other. We try to complement and supplement the work that we do and there have been many coalitions that have been formed out of that. Um, for example, I'm often in conversation with, uh, you know, the, the the head of the Anti Defamation League when there are anti Semitic comments that uh, implicate both of our communities and make us think about how we need to respond. Or similarly, as I mentioned, with anti Asian violence or or other communities that face challenges, and that's the type of um, 
that's the type of humanity that we're trying to model for the rest of the world as well, that we can have distinct causes, we can have communities that we want to focus on and serve, but we can also see the humanity and see the vulnerability in others, and we can also come to their aid. That is the way in which you operate as an inclusive democracy, as one that uh, is pluralistic and also sees itself as, as a holistic organism. I'm Mary Duchak. I'm a faculty member. Thank you so much for being with us. We're so honored to have you at Emory, at Emory Law. I, I wonder if you could, um, you know, your remarks are so inspiring, um, but at the same time, I'm also thinking about the state of the court. Um, and I, I wonder whether you could say a little bit about how uh, the current state of the Supreme Court um, is affecting thinking about um, strategy, is there perhaps an interest in state courts um, that's that's more robust than it might have been? Um, Maryland is such a great uh, story. I don't know about the courts in Maryland, but um, but some courts are, 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 are much more progressive um, towards civil rights. And uh, whether you're with legislation sort of taking the long game um, or whether, you know, with the state of the court affects really even a uh, legislative strategy at, at this point. I, I just wonder what your thoughts are. Yeah, it, it is almost uh, impossible to talk about progress without talking about the state of the Supreme Court. Um, and as you might imagine, the Legal Defense Fund uh, has a very, a, a very uh, interesting relationship with the Supreme Court, right? We've had some of our most important victories through litigation before the Supreme Court. We helped produce the first black Supreme Court justice. We're lawyers, we have a vested interest in our judicial system and seeing it work. In this moment, we've had to make the very hard decision of talking about this court in its current composition and being as truthful and factual about it as, as we possibly can without undermining the integrity of the entire institution because we do still believe in it. Um, it has forced us to think more expansively, hence the conversation about it takes more than just laws, it takes people, it takes movements, it takes um, a confluence of all of that to instigate real durable change. And we have not abandoned the Supreme Court, we, we can't afford to, we're not the only game in town, cases will go to the Supreme Court and we have to have a voice in them. But we are looking at state Supreme Courts, um, we are looking at alternatives I'll give an example. We um, relatively infrequently, if, if almost never, weigh in on state judicial appointments. Uh, we had the difficult decision of putting out a statement in opposition of Hector LaSalle, who was being nominated to be a chief judge of the Court of Appeals in New York, which is our, our highest court. Uh, and his vote did not make it out of committee yesterday. There was a lot of opposition to him. Um, and that is because the urgency of protecting state courts has become so acute in light of the state of the Supreme Court that we need every possible alternative venue protected from uh, capture as possible. So, so we're making difficult decisions even as an organization. Uh, Hector LaSalle would have been the first Latino chief judge in the history of the state. And we fully support diversity racial diversity, professional diversity, all forms of diversity in the judiciary. However, that appointment would have undermined civil rights and protections that we care deeply about and, and which we feel are for, we have uh, you know, foreclosed avenues of redress in light of where the Supreme Court is. So you, you are right to raise that. And we have been thinking about ways in which the Supreme Court can be reformed to rehabilitate its integrity. And these are very, very difficult questions, but we are not prepared to give up on that third branch of government that has been so critical to our advancement as, as a nation. 
Hi, um, my name is uh, Greg Nevins. I'm a lawyer with the Lambda Legal here in Atlanta. And I just wanted to echo what you said previously about the organizations working together and and, and thank the uh, uh, Legal Defense Fund for everything it's done in, uh, on, on issues because, you know, there's a there's a moral authority that the Legal Defense Fund carries that, that is just, you know, really unmatched and and, the, and, and, and and lending its voice in support of other causes has really been instrumental in, 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 in a lot of our victories. And, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, so I wanted to thank you for that. I uh, my question actually went to goes to, and I feel almost a little bit naive because I, I, I fully I, I, I appreciate everything you said about how how the hard work that is in front of the country and trying to confront its its uh, uh, you know its racist past, and, and I I. I I keep thinking, and I'm perhaps naively, that you know, uh, that the summer in the summer of 2020, it seemed as though, um, you know, uh, that there was some so, seemed like there was some potential of a breakthrough, and 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 people realizing that 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 uh, you know, and and, it, and granted, it it should have come much earlier. There not as though there weren't other tragedies and, and police shootings that, that that that, but but still, at that moment, it seemed as though people were I mean, people got out and marched in a pandemic, and they were they seemed willing to uh, uh, you know. Listen to the fact that, that of, of, of all the and, and all that uh, of, of, of all the oppression that had happened, and 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 then all of a sudden in the next year, year and a half, it all became like, oh no, we, we don't want any part of that. The, 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 you know, CRT was was the worst thing ever, and we don't we we don't want anything that's uncomfortable. And I I like how do we how do we get back to or how do we get to a moment where we where we truly embrace the 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 need to confront the past the need to appreciate the history and 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 not suffer you know a whiplash kind of thing where, where i and i just want to know what your thoughts were about that because it's it still haunts me that that it seemed as though and maybe i maybe i'm naive and but that that we we seem to be on the on the precipice of maybe a, a, a there's a racial reckoning that people have talked about for for decades and decades and 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 yet and, and now here we are with with the youngkin and, and desantis regime and anything any thoughts you have? on that i'd be eager to hear yeah absolutely i have, I have two two thoughts in response and thank you for for that acknowledgement we um really cherish our partnership with lambda legal um so two two things one i think that 2020 was not a failure you know there are a lot of people who feel very frustrated because there was such momentum there was something um groundbreaking that happened there was nothing like that in this country even the civil rights movement where you had that many people across this country and across the world calling for a racial reckoning. That had not ever happened in the history of this world before, right? So that was truly precedential. Um, and what I think, there are many reasons why that momentum has slowed down. One is that it caught the attention of a very threatened minority of people in this country that are well-resourced and are extremely strategic in shaping narrative and in eclipsing the messaging of this country. A majority of people in this country support reproductive freedom, for example. You would never know that if you were just to look at um, the results in the Supreme Court and just to look at or listen to some of the rhetoric that we hear through media and on the sound waves. What, what I think we were not prepared for, or at least some of us weren't prepared for, is the perpetual cycle of backlash whenever there's progress in this country, right? We, we, we see it time and again, whether it's reconstruction, uh, whether it is the civil rights movement, whether it was the election of the first black president, which is, we're still, we're still paying for that, right? Um, if there's always a backlash. And, and again, in 2020, when you saw people of all races and backgrounds and economic um, profiles being ignited around this issue of violence and racial discrimination, that was threatening. But there are still people reading more books about race than now than they were before 2020. I just experienced in speaking to everyday people a more just more fluency about these issues, about racial conditions and, a, and an admission of the history of this country that, you know, we used to have to convince people that <laughs> racism is still you know, alive and well, and it's and it's thriving, and and it needs to be confronted. So this country has been changed, you know, irreversibly by 2020. What we need to do now, though, is have a counterattack to the backlash, 
and 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 we're still reeling, right? We're still reeling from that. We listen, we're still in a pandemic, call it what you want, but there's a lot of forces that explain why um the organization, the 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 type of strategic response that this requires has not yet fully formed, but it is still important. The other thing I will say is I think this is a a a an example of the condition that I mentioned, and that is we will not solve the issue of race through one summer of protests. No matter how big it is, no matter how many people are part of it, it is. it has to be sustained. So the disappointment that we all feel that it didn't go as far as it could have is in part informed by this notion that we're gonna solve this through one big uh, event or one big reckoning or, or, or one big truth telling or reconciliation process. No, my belief, and many people don't share this, but I, I feel very strongly racism will always be with us. It is embedded in the soil and soul of this country, but it is our job to constantly work against that force and work against its effects. And we have to accept that reality. And the trade-off we get is this beautiful mosaic of people and this experiment of democracy and this country that looks unlike any other place in the world. That's the trade-off for us doing the hard work of trying to keep that deep racism at bay. I think that's the most we can do, but the reward is so great if we could all only see it. We are gonna to need to make these two questions our last two in the interest of time. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Gabrielle. I'm a sophomore at Emory College. Thank you so much for speaking this evening. I especially connect to the urgency of now and daring to dream. Um, and adding on to the piece about a backlash, what can we do when we see something, uh, an injustice so wrong here in Atlanta, referring specifically to the construction of the $90 million cop city police facility being built in South Atlanta against the wishes of the nearby community, and somebody was just shot and killed there yesterday. Um, how can we respond to that when there doesn't seem to be any viable paths of legal justice? Um, when we've seen two community sessions where community members have said, we don't want this. When we've seen a mayor, Andre Dickens, say, I'm not going to vote for this and then go ahead and vote for this. What what can we do? Yeah, well, that obviously is not an easy question to answer. Um, you know, one one of the things, and I've already talked about what I think we can do as, as people to, um, you know, to, to call the question, right? I, I do think we underestimate the power of people protesting and 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 having sustained civil disobedience and i think 2020 was a good example of what that could at least instigate but we also there must be accountability right there must be a way in which we hold our elected officials accountable we hold their feet to the fire it's harder to do that when you are faced with voter suppression laws that stifle turnout and that um suppress the vote but it doesn't have to only happen on election day confronting elected officials with their failed promises, um, you know, undermining the the projects that they are trying to advance uh, can have great effect. It's not easy to do. Um, organizing communities that are already being disenfranchised and have many other problems to solve is is not an easy task. And that is the role that I hope organizations like the Legal Defense Fund can help play. That's why we have a team of organizers. We've expanded our organizing team over time because we saw the need of building that people power in a real way and empowering communities to sustain that on their own, uh, giving them the tools that they need even when we can't be there. But these are not these are not easy questions. And so I don't have a, you know, I, I wish I did have the strategy uh, to push back on the the construction of that facility, but it is something that um, I'd love to talk to you more about. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for speaking. Um, this is actually really in line with the last question. Um, and I've been lucky to be part of both political and nonpartisan uh, organizing, grassroots organizing efforts here in, in Atlanta and in Georgia. And I think just across the board, there's this overwhelming feeling that, you know, the fight for voting and civil rights are just already been bought out, frankly, by industry interests. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, what do you feel like or what do you think actually are the most strategic ways that just a single person or a handful of people can really commit their efforts to, but 
at the same time, not fight what feels like futile fights. Like what are the most strategic ways that people can commit their efforts? Um, is that like, you know, does that include lobbying elected officials? Like, frankly, do they still listen to normal people anymore? Is it more like, is it more strategic to just lobby industry instead because they seem to have the ear of a lot of elected officials? I just wanted to get your thoughts on what was best use of a single person's time. Yeah, no, that's a, that's another really good question. I think, uh, you know, part of it is, is determined by, you know, your strength and your access. Um, I can't say that there's a particular strategy that I think, um, you know, a superlative strategy that's going to do the, the most work. You know, I believe a lot in the right to vote as someone who actually did not when I first, um, you know, when I, when I first got into this work, I, I did not believe in the power of it at all. Um, I really do think voting plus organizing plus accountability, it's, it's really not just that election day, but it's the accountability that you bring to it can be very powerful. It is the currency that all of us possesses. It's, it's one of the most equalizing forces in this country that we all, if you're eligible, have a vote to cast and can determine whether someone is in or out. But once they are in, we have to hold them accountable. The lobbying piece is, um, is a difficult one because there's so much money and so much dark money and untraceable money that um, overrides, but I'm assuming you could be the wealthiest person in the, in, the, in the world, but I'm assuming that the average person cannot compete with, right? So that makes it a little difficult. It doesn't mean though that um, you joining voice, forces with friends and, and, and others um, and confronting those who aren't acting in your best interest will not hold some sway. And, and, and the, the last thing I'll say is that's, um, that's interesting about this generation is that there's a lot of power in social media. There's a lot of power in, in, in amplifying your voice in ways that did not always exist. And I think we underestimate that tool in some ways as well. And that may be something worth considering. Thank you. Thank you. So first, I want to thank Janae for these very inspiring words. So I'm sitting here kind of in a similar position. I've done a lot of this work before, and you can often become frustrated, um, suffer from anxiety, but it's all about pulling yourself back together and, and working hard. And I wanna add one thing because you, in one of your answers, it kind of brought this to mind. John Lewis said that freedom is not an event, <laughs> okay? And I thought of that as the question about 2020 seemed like we had it. And his response would be, it's not an event. It's a lifetime struggle. So I hope that you, like I, am recommitted to that struggle. And a token of our appreciation, I'm going to present this to Janae. Final round of applause before the refreshments outside. Oh, we do. Okay. All right. So I do. I